Camp David, I think around the year 2000, 2002, I'm not sure exactly. Would, there was President Bill Clinton, Yasser Arafat of the Palestinians, Ehud Barak, who was the Israeli Prime Minister at the time. Ehud Barak, the Israeli Prime Minister, offered the Palestinians, Yasser, Yasser Arafat, right. in return for agreement, and in return for peace, everything except what was under the Temple Mount. After all, that's the remains of the Jewish Temple from biblical times. And uh, on top was the Arab mosques, or the Muslim mosques. What was interesting that Bill Clinton, I think, comments in his book, is like Arafat jumped up and started to become nervous and shake his hands and said, there never was a Jewish temple. Which even Muslim sources talk about Solomon's temple that was on, that, on the Temple Mount. And then he said the key as he's shaking, I will not have tea with Sadat. What does this mean? Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president, signed an agreement with Israel. As a result, he was assassinated. Yasser Arafat knew that if he signed a permanent agreement and end of conflict, and that Israel had right to any of this territory, which was Muslim territory because it was conquered by Muslims. Once a territory is conquered by Islam, it's Muslim forever, according to Islam. Is that uh, from the time of the Ottomans or before? That's from the time of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Here's the proof. Uh, the Arabic, the Hebrew word to open, comes from the root of p, t, and h. The Arabic word is the same root. F, Arab doesn't have a P. F, T, N, H. Now it means to open the door. I opened the door, Fatah al Bab in Arabic, but it has another meaning. It means to conquer for Islam. And once you open up a territory for Islam, it must remain Muslim forever. Now, Spain was Muslim from 712 when the Muslim conqueror, Jebel, rather Tariq his name was, Jebel Tariq, Gibraltar, it's a formation, means the Jebel in Arabic is mountain. It means the mountain of Tariq, it becomes Gibraltar. Once they entered Spain, the territory belonged to Muslims. They lost Spain in 1492. And they had never come to grips with the fact that they no longer own it because it was open, Fatah, that word. It was open for Islam and therefore remains Muslim forever. And there are organizations in Spain today which are preparing for the reconquest of Spain 525 years later for Islam. Now where does Israel fit into this? Israel was conquered by the Muslims in 637, not the West Bank, not the Gaza Strip, but all of what is biblical Israel, which includes the state of Israel of today, the West Bank, and Gaza. If it was conquered by Muslims, if it was opened up for Islam, it belongs to Islam forever. And any Muslim who would give it up and agree to recognize a Jewish state would be subject to being killed. He would be shaming the honor of Islam. He would be shaming the Arabs. Now, if you notice, the Saudis have said, we will accept any agreement that the Palestinians agree to. Now, the Saudis are, shall we say, one of the most fanatical types of Islam, called Wahhabi Islam. Are they really prepared to give up that land? No, but who will be blamed for it? It'll be the Palestinians that are held responsible, not the Saudis. And so the Saudis want the Palestinians to take the blame. And when in the Middle East you are blamed, you are shamed. What does shame mean? It's what other people think of you. And therefore no one will marry your daughters, no one will marry in your family. And you must be killed because you cannot give up Muslim land to a non-Muslim. There is a permanent battle in Islam, since bygones are never bygones, between the Muslim world, the world called Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam, and Dar al-Harb. The non-Muslim world, which in exact Arabic is the abode or the world, the world of Harb means war. And they are permanent until the entire world becomes Muslim. Now how and when that happens is up to Allah. 
And look, that's the way it is. So the idea of them recognizing Israel in any form, if Yasser Arafat couldn't do it, certainly Mahmoud Abbas, the, that is also called Abu Mazen, he can't do that. He will be slaughtered if he does such a horrible thing. This is the problem. There is no compromise. There's no concept of compromise as you and I know it in English. Because compromise means you give a little, I give a little. In the Middle East, if you give a little, that means you are being shamed. And you may not, it's better to be killed than to be shamed. These are concepts which are not part of our vocabulary and not part of our world. So all these attempts by foreign leaders to bring peace a word that does not, a concept that does not exist as we know it in the West to the Arabs and to the Israelis or to anybody else. It's not possible from a Muslim point of view. You're, you aren't just talking about uh, the West Bank and, and Gaza. No, of course not. I'm talking about Spain. I'm talking about Southern Europe, which was ruled by the Ottoman Turks, which is why Prime Minister or President Dictator Erdogan in Turkey also is so interested in re-establishing the Ottoman Caliphate to eventually rule all the Muslim world and in the future set the path that the entire world becomes Muslim. Because that's what Allah wants according to the Muslim holy book, the Quran. Uh, is this taught uh, exclusively through the ISIS website? What are you talking about? ISIS is just one of the many forms of it. This is the ultimate Muslim goal. I want to just say, I hate every word that I'm saying to you. And I grew up a nice American boy, just wanting to try to make peace between first the Arabs and the Israelis, and then the Muslims and the rest of the world. It's a very admirable goal. It is how the Americans understand the world. Everybody giving in a little, signing an agreement. Agreements to us are holy, they're written, but not in the Muslim world. They are nothing, just as I mentioned before in a, on Iran, they are nothing more than steps along the way to get to the goal. My goal is to, I must rule, if you're not a Muslim, you must know your place. And it's not at the table, it is secondary. You are what is called dhimmi, you're a second class citizen, and you're not even a citizen. Only Muslims are allowed to rule the Muslim world. So of course Israel has no right to rule any part of Israel, even Tel Aviv. And neither can Madrid be ruled by the Spanish. Uh, is this a, a threat to countries with large new uh, Muslim immigrants from the Middle East? Excellent question. It's obvious. The answer is yes. But see, here's the difference. In the Middle East, people know how to wait. And they'll go and they've established all these communities in Europe for example, and they, they, they wait and they wait. We want it yesterday. We want it now. They, on the other hand, want the future. They are prepared to wait until they reach critical mass. The Muslims were stopped twice at the gates of Vienna, the second time in 1683. And uh, now, two things. Number one, it's interesting on what day they were stopped in 1683. I don't think it would surprise you if I told you it was September 11th, 1683. Uh, now, which is, see, everything with the Muslims is symbolic for the West. Get them back the way they got you. But now the Muslims take the airplane and the train around Vienna, and they're in the process of taking the whole place over. They don't, they're not prepared to assimilate into French, German, uh, whatever culture. If they were, they should be accepted. If Islam is only a religion, great. Then they could become part of the vast Dutch culture, German culture, or French culture. But that is not how they see it. They are overwhelmingly not prepared to assimilate, and they are going to make the Europeans assimilate to them. That, if we're not careful, how, can, if, if we're not careful here in the United States, that could, with time, happen here as well. The question is, do we believe in the values of the founding fathers of democracy, freedom, and human rights? That our identity, our common identity is American and all our others are secondary. American being American is a political identity. We don't try to force others 
to be like us, but we demand basic things. Or we, we, at least our founding fathers, did. you will learn English and you will have every opportunity in this country, but you will not impose your foreign culture on us. That's the long-term battle that we here in the United States face as well. Are we up to the task? I hope so. Uh -huh. To what extent are uh, Muslim Americans influenced by their culture, uh, their, their cultural allegiance to conquer America for Allah? Well, I don't really know if we can say this, if we can uh, answer this question. What we understand is the context and most of the mosques in this country are in the control of the fundamentalists. Be they, they're almost overwhelmingly Saudi Sunni controlled. There are a few which are Iranian, but they are both antithetical to the long-term interests of the culture of the United States of America. So those who are opposing immigration on the basis of country of origin from Muslim countries, are they naive? Americans believe that underneath the surface of every human being is a closet American. That they believe in live and let live that everybody thinks the same. And once they learn the holy language, and that's English, then they're gonna think like us. Unfortunately, there are peoples that come here who have different views. Again, if they are prepared to assimilate into the basic values of the United States, of course we should welcome them. But history shows us that this is not the case.